Are you ready for the word? Yes. Turn to Luke chapter 2. I was going to return to uh, Genesis 12 <clears throat> this morning and continue our study through the book of Genesis. <clears throat> Pardon me. As I said, I was going to return to Genesis 12 this morning to continue our study there. But we have something we need to do, and rather than just putting it on as uh, an attachment to Genesis 12, I decided to dedicate the whole service to that thing that we need to do. We're going to pick up reading in verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Yeshua, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Uh, they didn't choose that name. Yahweh chose that name. Matthew records the event uh, in chapter 1 of his gospel where he talks about how Joseph was contemplating putting Mary away privately. And uh, an angel appeared to him. The angel of Yahweh, it says, appeared to him and explained what was going on. He told Joseph, fear not to take her to you for a wife. Uh, for that which is conceived in her is of the Ruach HaKadosh. And uh, then in Matthew one twenty one, we read this. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua. And then it goes on to explain why you will call him Yeshua. It says, for he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means nothing. It has no meaning. But the name Yahshua means exactly what Matthew 1.21 says it would mean. He shall save. Yahweh saves is what his name means. And so you call him Yahweh saves because Yahweh shall save his people from their sins. Um, and when the, look in verse 22. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses, which is Torah, when the days of her purification were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to Yahweh. So we have to stop right here if we're going to understand what's going on in Luke chapter 2. You can't read past statements like this in verse 22 and understand what's going on if you don't go read what they read. Because it says that we're told that they're doing things in Luke chapter 2 that were commanded in the law of Moses. <laughs> So we got to read what they read if we want to know why they did what they did. And if we know why they did what they did, it will help us understand why we should do what we should do. That make sense? Yes. All right. <clears throat> now Luke gave a brief explanation of what's written in the law of Moses in verse 23 and verse 24. So we'll read his brief summary, but we want to go read the text for ourselves. In verse 23, Luke says... As it is written in the law of Yahweh, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to Yahweh. Verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of Yahweh, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So Luke's letting us know that they had come to the temple to fulfill a twofold obligation that they had according to instructions in Torah. The first obligation they had was for Mary to bring an offering to Yahweh. She had to accomplish that for her own purification. And number two, her male child, Luke said, is holy. Which means set apart for Yahweh. Which means that she had some obligations. She and Joseph had some obligations concerning him. <clears throat> so they have shown up at the temple to fulfill these obligations. Let's go read the whole text instead of the summary and see what those obligations are. Go to Leviticus chapter 12. All right, look in verse 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived seed and born a man child, then she shall be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation of her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, and she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days, she shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. 
So you got seven days ritually unclean. The eighth day is the day of circumcision. And then 33 days more beyond that for a total of 41 days. Verse 5. But if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her separation. And she shall continue in the blood of her purifying three score and six days. So you got 14 days plus 36 days for a total of 50 days. Verse 6. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest. That's the reason Luke mentions the doves or pigeons. He says a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons is because Leviticus here is requiring that she bring those. It says a lamb or uh, the doves and pigeons if they cannot afford a, a lamb. Verse 7. Who shall offer it before Yahweh, make an atonement for her. She shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that has born a male or a female. So Leviticus 12 explains to us why Mary had come to the temple with turtle doves or pigeons. Uh, she has come to make an atonement for herself. But what about the part where Luke mentions the male being holy? Well, that instruction is given to us before the children of Israel ever leave Egypt. It's found in Exodus chapter 13. Turn there. Exodus 13, look in verse 11. And it shall be when Yahweh shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto you and to your fathers, and shall give it to you. I'm not going to read past that and just go on to our subject. <laughs> That's a powerful verse. When Yahweh shall bring you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto you and to your fathers, and shall give it to you. What Yahweh promises, he shall do. Yes. Every time. Absolutely. Always. Yes. Without fail. <laughs> Here they are still in Egypt. But Moses knows what Yahweh promised Abraham. And because Yahweh promised it, it's going to take place. And so he's telling them, even though they haven't left Egypt yet, Yahweh promised it, folks. Write it down. It's going to happen. And when it does happen then I've got some instruction for you. But it, it's not a matter of if it happens. It's a matter of when because it's going to happen. Yes. We need to remember that. What Yahweh promises, He does every time, all the time, without fail. Verse 12. Here's what you're to do when you get there. You shall set apart. That's what the word holy means, is to be set apart. You shall set apart unto Yahweh all that opens the matrix. And every firstling that comes of a beast which you have, the males shall be Yahweh's. And every firstling of an ass you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break his neck. And all the firstborn of man among your children shall you redeem. They're not yours. They belong to Yahweh. You'll, you'll give them to Yahweh or you will redeem them for a price and keep them for yourself. Verse 14. It shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? That you shall say unto him, By strength of hand, Yahweh brought us out from, the, from Egypt, from the house of bondage. When you do this redemptive process, they're going to say, Why are we doing this? And you're going to remind them of what Yahweh did for us when we were in bondage in Egypt. Verse 15. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh could hardly let us go, that Yahweh slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to Yahweh all that opens the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thy hand and for frontless between thine eyes, for by strength of hand Yahweh brought us forth out of Egypt. That is, this is just going to be another thing you do. Passover is one of the things we do. Unleavened bread is one of the things we do. But Yahweh says, this is another thing I want you to do so that you never forget that I came and got you out of Egypt. You were in bondage. There was no way for you to get out. 
I came and got you. I don't want you to ever forget that. Let this be a reminder of what I have done uh, for you, okay? Strength of hand, Yahweh brought us forth out of Egypt. Now, to get a full, clear picture, we need to go read uh, a portion out of Exodus 34. So turn there. Look in verse 19. All that opens the matrix is mine. Every firstling among your cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. But the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if you redeem him not, then shall you break his neck. Same thing told in Exodus 13. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem. Not an option. You shall redeem. And none shall appear before me empty. So that's what Mary and Joseph are doing at the temple this day, according to Luke chapter 2. They're there to bring her offering, and they're there to redeem their firstborn son. Well, how? When we're seeing why they did it. They did it because of what's written in Exodus 13, Exodus 34, Leviticus 12. That's why. But how do they redeem him? Well, let's go read that out of Numbers chapter 3. Numbers 3, look in verse 40. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Number all the firstborn of the males of the children of Israel from a month old and upward, and take the number of their names. And you shall take the Levites for me. I am Yahweh. You shall take the Levites for me. I am Yahweh. I have a right to demand this and to require this because of who I am. This is not up for negotiation. We're not going to discuss it. I am Yahweh. You shall take the Levites for me instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel. In other words, by the time you get to this place in numbers, they haven't been redeeming their firstborn. Even though they were told to in Exodus, well, they haven't really taken possession of the land yet, and they were told to do it when they get to the land. But Yahweh says, here's what we're going to do before we start that process. We're, we're going to make an exchange, okay? And, and the cattle of the Levites instead of all the firstlings among the cattle of the children of Israel. Here's the way we're going to start. Verse 42, Moses numbered, as Yahweh commanded him, all the firstborn among the children of Israel, and all the firstborn males by the number of names from a month old and upward, of those that were numbered of them were twenty and two thousand two hundred three score and thirteen. So that's twenty two thousand two hundred and seventy three. Twenty two thousand two hundred seventy three. And Yahweh spoke unto Moses, saying, Take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle, and the Levites shall be mine, I am Yahweh. Said it again. And for those that are to be redeemed of the two hundred and three score and thirteen of the firstborn of the children of Israel, which are more than the Levites. So let's stop there and explain what just happened. Yahweh setting aside the Levites for his purposes in this passage. He's re using the redemption of the firstborn as a means to do this. He's had Moses number all of the firstborn of the children of Israel from, 30, uh, from one month old and up. And the total was 22,273. When all the counting was done, there were 273 more of the firstborn in the children of Israel than there were males of the Levites. 22,000 males of the Levites, 22,273 firstborn of the children of Israel. Did Yahweh say, well, okay, close enough, we'll just call it even, we'll start from scratch? <clears throat> no. He said, I'm going to take the Levites as a redemption for the 22,000 firstborn, and for the other 273, he says, you're going to redeem them. So let's see how he says there to do that. Read the next verse, verse 47. You shall even take five shekels apiece by the pole. After the shekel of the sanctuary shall you take them. The shekel is 20 giras. And you shall give the money wherewith the odd number of them is to be redeemed unto Aaron and to his sons. 
And Moses took the redemption money of them that were over and above them that were redeemed by the Levites. Of the firstborn of the children of Israel took he the money, a thousand, three hundred, three score, and five shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary. So, Israel, to redeem the 273, says that they brought 1,365 shekels of silver. 1,365 shekels. Now, if you do the math and divide 1,365 by 5, you find out it comes to 273. That's how many they were over. So 273 times 5 comes to 1,365. So there is five shekels of silver, silver required for this exchange to take place, this redemption to take place. Verse 51, And Moses gave the money of them that were redeemed unto Aaron and to his sons according to the word of Yahweh, as Yahweh commanded Moses. Now, <clears throat> I just wanted us to see that it doesn't matter how old the firstborn is whether it's an infant or whether it's older, we never pass from this responsibility of redeeming the firstborn son. Okay? But I can't move on from this text without asking, as I have before, why did Yahweh choose the Levites? Because that's where we first see this redemption thing taking place so why did he choose the Levites? He could have chose any one of the tribes. Any of them. But he chose the Levites. And let me tell you why I suspect that he chose him. Chose them. I think he chose them because of the display of boldness and courage and tenacity uh, and dedication and determination that the sons of Levi demonstrated. <clears throat> Do you remember the golden calf incident? You remember when Moses and Aaron come down off the mountain and they find the children of Israel having a party around this golden calf and, and say that the golden calf represented Yahweh that delivered them out of Egypt and they have declared a feast, uh, made their own holy day for the celebration of this golden calf. And, and Moses lost it. <clears throat> Moses became uh, very irate. He, he explodes in anger, and well, he should have. <clears throat> but after he explains to these people how horrible a thing that they have done, he asked this question, who is on Yahweh's side? Now, he's gone to the trouble of explaining how wrong they are. And how what they've done will not be tolerated. And then he says, who is on Yahweh's side? Well, all of them should have said, well, we are. We repent. We'll fix it. We're sorry. But they didn't. Here's what we read in verse 26 of Exodus 32. <clears throat> Moses stood in the, camp, the gate of the camp and said, Who is on Yahweh's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. <coughs> Where are the rest of them? Where's everybody else? Where are the other tribes? Where are the other men? As Elijah would say, they're halting between two opinions. <clears throat> now, I don't know. Exactly. Why Yahweh chose the Levites. But I do know. That when it came time to make a stand against paganism. And to make a stand for the true worship of Yahweh, the Levites are the ones who answered the call. And so because they answered the call and proved themselves in that time of testing, Yahweh chose them. And he just didn't give them priestly duties. I don't know what we think priestly duties are, but I can assure you being a priest was hard 
work. It was so difficult a work that Yahweh mandated that after a man turned 50, he was to be relieved of the duties concerning the temple. He could still be a priest, he could still be involved, but the duties involved in the tabernacle and the temple were so demanding that once a man turned 50, Yahweh said, let him back off from that a little bit. <coughs> Understand that Yahweh did not just give them light duty. He chose these men because he knew they could stand up under the load of what it would take to be a priest in his kingdom. You read the book of Numbers. And you'll find out that when he placed them, he placed them on all four sides of the tabernacle. That's where their, their camp was. He placed them there to protect it at all times because he knew they would. I said that to say this. Yahweh never chooses those who are timid and fearful. He never chooses to use the timid or the fearful. Yahweh does not choose men who are effeminate or prissy. Yeshua said, when he was talking about, remember, Yochanan the baptizer, John the Baptist? Yeshua said, those who wear fine clothing are in the king's palace. You bothered by John's appearance? Yochanan's appearance? You're bothered by his appearance? Oh, don't be bothered by his appearance. You ought to be bothered by the appearance of those who are walking inside the king's palace and their fine clothing. He said, you find those with fine clothing in the king's palace. They're working for the king. They're getting their instruction from the politicians. They're getting their instructions from somebody else. They're not getting their instructions from Yahweh. John, Yochanan, gets his instruction from Yahweh himself. If a man's soft, if a man's prissy, he doesn't work for Yahweh. If a man is reluctant to work or fight, he has no place in the kingdom of Yahweh. Yahweh chooses men who have what the world calls toxic masculinity. And what the world calls toxic, Yahweh would call it essential. Masculinity is essential to manhood. Without masculinity, you're not a man. It's not toxic. Masculinity is what makes the righteous man step forward when the call is made. Who is on Yahweh's side? It takes masculinity in a man to say, that's me, I am. I'll take on this fight. Yahweh has never said, I, I like how soft-spoken he is and, and how he dresses and the fine shoes he wears and, and how he always tries to get along with everybody. I like that. I think I'll call him to represent me. No. He chooses Levites who neither fear hard work nor battles. You get that as an extra. Now let's go on and talk about redemption. And we see in Numbers 3 that it doesn't matter the age of the firstborn son. If he has never been redeemed, then Yahweh expects him to be. We see that the redemption price is five shekels of silver. It's hard to know exactly how much a shekel converts to in our day and time, but we do know it's somewhere between two and a half ounces to four ounces of silver. And the value of four ounces of silver fluctuates day by day. So we have to go by the weight, not by the value, and the weight is somewhere around two and a half to four ounces. Go now to Numbers 18. If you've ever wondered what the tithe is for, the answer for you is in Numbers 18. And when you read it, uh, Numbers 18, you'll find out the tithe is not so a collective body can put all their money together and build them real nice sanctuaries, padded pews, and gymnasiums. 
read it and see. Yahweh says the tithe is mine. And then Yahweh gives it away. We don't. We give it to Yahweh because it's his. Yahweh then gives it away. Read Numbers 18, see where it goes. <clears throat> but this morning, this morning we're reading about the redemption of the firstborn. So let's pick up in verse 15. Everything that opens the matrix in all flesh which you bring unto Yahweh, whether it be of men or beasts, shall be yours. He's talking to the Levites. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man shall you surely redeem, and the firstling of unclean beasts shall you redeem. And those that are to be redeemed from a month old shall you redeem according to your estimation. For the money of five shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, which is twenty giras. But the firstling of a cow or the firstling of a sheep or the firstling of a goat, you shall not redeem. They are holy. You shall sprinkle their blood upon the altar and shall burn their fat for an offering made by fire for a sweet savor unto Yahweh. So the basic point here is the price of redemption for a firstborn son is five shekels of silver. So let's summarize real quickly. Firstborn sons are redeemed. That doesn't make them more valuable than the other sons or daughters. The redemption of the firstborn son is tied, tied to two things. First of all, it's tied to the fact that Yahweh wants us to remember what happened at the first Passover. He wants us to remember what Passover and unleavened bread are all about. He wants us to remember the deliverance that took place out of Egypt, which foreshadows our deliverance out of the bondage of sin. So that's the primary reason for doing this, is as a reminder. The second thing is, the reason for the firstborn son, we need to remember there is an order in every home. Yahweh establishes the order of the home. He doesn't leave it up to us to, to establish the order of a home. He establishes it. And the firstborn son, though not of more value, is to receive a different inheritance than the others. All of this signifying, as I said, that Yahweh has an order he expects us to follow. The second thing we find is the redemption price is five shekels or around two to four ounces of silver. So we, when we go back to Luke 2, and that's where I want you to return, please. This is what Mary and Joseph have come to do. They have come so that Mary could bring her offering of the turtle doves for her atonement. But they've also come to redeem their firstborn son, Yeshua. Verse 25 of Luke 2. Let's see what took place as they're in the temple doing this. <clears throat> Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Ruach, Ruach HaKadosh was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Ruach HaKadosh that he should not see death, before he had seen Yahweh's Messiah. And he came by the Ruach into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Yeshua to do for him after the custom of the law. What is, what is it they're come to do after the custom of the law? To redeem him. Then... Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed Elohim and said, Yahweh, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them. And he said unto Mary his mother, Behold, 
This child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword shall pierce, you, pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And this is where I want us to, to focus. There was one Anna, a prophet, not really a prophetess, it says a prophet. Anna was a prophet, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served Elohim with fasting and prayers night and day. So she's at least 84 years old. She had only been married for seven years. The rest of her life had been dedicated to prayer and fasting. Verse 38. She coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto Yahweh and spoke of him to all them that look for redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of Yahweh, they returned unto Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. So verse 38, notice what she did. She gave thanks unto Yahweh and she spoke of Yeshua to all them that look for redemption in Jerusalem. <clears throat> that is, she spoke to everyone she could find in Jerusalem who had been looking for redemption. She talked to them about the Redeemer, Yeshua. She came into the temple on the day of his redemption and began to give thanks and to make proclamations. It's as if she's trying to get people's attention. Because sometimes people can see things and not know what they're seeing. Others may have been seeing the same thing she was seeing, but didn't really see what they should have been seeing. And so she's trying to call everybody's attention to what they're actually seeing. This isn't just another son that's being redeemed according to the law of Moses. She, she is saying that he, the, the Redeemer is being redeemed. She is saying this child who is being redeemed is the Redeemer. Don't y'all see? Our Redeemer is being redeemed. And he's being redeemed with silver. But not us. We also have to be redeemed, but not with silver and gold. But with blood. We'll be redeemed with the precious blood of a lamb without spot or blemish. From that day on, she went through all Jerusalem telling people about the Redeemer who had been redeemed, the Redeemer who's going to redeem us with His own precious blood. Wow. What an awesome day in the temple that was. And how good it is for us to rejoice in our redemption. Redemption simply means to pay for the release of by paying the ransom of. To pay a ransom... To get a release. Pay a ransom to get a release is what redemption means. Which is what the redemption of the firstborn is all about. It is a reminder for the night of Passover. When all the firstborn were killed. Those covered by the blood were spared that night. A ransom had been paid for their release. Those who went into a home where the blood was applied, the wrath that moved through that night and the judgment that moved through that night and took the firstborn did not take the firstborn inside that home. There's a judgment still to come of which we are saved and delivered from, safe from by the blood of Yeshua who ransomed us from that coming judgment. Well, let me close by saying this. This is all great to read about, but should we today still redeem our firstborn? 
<clears throat> does this still apply to us? Is it still something we should do? Well, of course, you know the answer is yes. Not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from the law. Yeshua was redeemed. And 1 John 2 says, He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So if you say, I abide in Yeshua, then you ought to walk as he walked. Well, what does that mean? That means the things he did while he was here, you shouldn't hesitate to do. And if he fulfilled the righteous demands of Torah, then you also, we also should fulfill those righteous demands. When he went to be baptized, Yochanan, the baptizer, said, oh, no, 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 I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And Yeshua said unto him, allow it to be so for now, for it is necessary that we becometh, I think is the word he used in the King James, it's necessary that we fulfill all righteousness. The law demands it. I'm going to do it, you're going to do it for me. If that was his attitude about Torah, that should be our attitude about Torah. There are two rules to keep in mind when trying to figure out if we're still to do a thing or not that's written in Torah. Two rules. It's written in Torah. Should I do it or should, should I not? Follow these two rules. Rule number one. We're only free to ignore commands Yahweh gave if Yahweh nullifies them. If he gave the command and you can't find a place where he nullified the command, it's still in place. There is no man who can veto Yahweh. So there's no man who can take a commandment of Yahweh and nullify it for him. No man can read the, what we call the New Testament, read that and say, well, because of what I read here, we're going to nullify some stuff out of the Tanakh or Torah or the Old Testament. A man does not have the authority to do that. The only one who can nullify anything Yahweh said is Yahweh himself. He said, have I not said, shall I not do? He says it, it it's, it's law, okay? So that's rule number one. Rule number two is this. He, nev he never nullifies anything he said. Right. So, rule number one is, if he gave a law, only he can nullify it. Rule number two is, he never nullifies his law. Never. He said it would be easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one jot or tittle to pass from the law. It'd be easier for you and I to move heaven and earth than it would be to take one jot or tittle from the law and make it void. So <clears throat> men may nullify Yahweh's laws, but Yahweh never does. And when men nullify Yahweh's laws, they create chaos and they open the door to a whole lot of wickedness. Every time. Every time they nullify any of his law, doesn't matter what it is, when they nullify it, they never see the full consequences of it. <clears throat> Come on now. Take the, take the Sabbath, for example. It's so easy to go back to that one because it's so major. But men thought, we'll just nullify that one. They could not see the compounding effect that that was going to have. By nullifying that one, they opened the door to evolution, the teaching of evolution. Because with the teaching of the Sabbath, you're teaching. Yahweh created everything in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. And the seventh day is holy because Yahweh rested on that day. But when you nullify that and take that out, now the teaching of evolution can come in and even thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who go and sit in churches every Sunday listening to supposedly the Bible being taught no longer believe in the creation story. They believe, believe in evolution because they think it's more intelligent. By nullifying the Sabbath, what happened... In a progression is, men begin to say, well, if we don't have to keep that law, 
Then what about this one? And what about this one? And what about this one? And what about this one? Until we've come into a day and time where, where grace has become lasciviousness. And men no longer believe they have to keep any of the law. That God's not mad at me no matter what. So men nullify the commandments of Yahweh. Yahweh never does. So, back to point. This morning, in order to accomplish what is written in the law concerning their firstborn son, Spencer and Stephanie have brought Nathaniel Andre Bolduc to Yahweh to redeem him per Yahweh's instruction. Bolduc. <laughs> the name Nathaniel means given by Yahweh or gift of Yahweh. He gave Nate to them. Y'all come on up. <coughs> but he requires the firstborn to be redeemed. They have come in obedience to give his ransom. So, this is a same thing you read about in Luke chapter 2. Uh, they have come this morning to accomplish what is written in the law of Moses. Y'all come on in and let the folks on Facebook see you there. Come on over here, Steph. <coughs> yeah, good deal. If it's written, we should do it. If it's written, we should do it. Let me see him. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. What do you think? Hmm? What do you think? Do you acknowledge that this young man is Yahweh's? Yes. Yahweh says the firstborn son is mine. You like that, didn't you? He smiled. You acknowledge that this is Yahweh's. <clears throat> Yahweh makes allowance for you to ransom him so that you may take him back home with you. But not to free him of his obligations to Yahweh. <clears throat> but by paying the ransom for him, you are declaring to Yahweh, I tell you what, let me get you to go ahead and pay the ransom for Yahweh. <laughs> And we'll put you back over here. The <laughs> ransom has been paid. He wanted to make, he seemed to doubt y'all were going to do that. But no, you, you did it. <clears throat> By paying the ransom, you are acknowledging and declaring that you will remind him of what you did for him. You will remind him that he does belong to Yahweh. You will remind him <clears throat> that you redeemed him with silver. But he needs another redemption that has to be done with blood. And that blood is the blood of a Messiah. You will teach him and instruct him in the ways of Yahweh. Yahweh's friendship with Abraham was birthed out of a, of a confidence that Yahweh had. Yahweh said, I know him. He will command his children concerning me. Yahweh trusts you to do the same thing concerning this young man. He would, he would never allow you to ransom him if he did not trust that you would raise him in the ways of Yahweh. Teach him Torah. Father, first of all, I thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, that we do not have to wander around in darkness and try to figure out what we should do and shouldn't do, but your word constantly, constantly shows us 
It's wisdom to us. It's insight for us. It's light on a darkened path. So, Father, I thank you, first of all, for Torah, for your word is truth. And I thank you for Spencer and Stephanie, who have a heart to obey your instruction and who have committed themselves to raise this son, Nate, in your nurture and in your admonition. I thank you for the warrior, for the kingdom of heaven that he shall become. That your hand shall be upon him from this day forward. And that your Ruach HaKadosh might rest upon his life. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you. So shall he himself bless you.